Guys, welcome back to season two of Ups and Downs for Star Trek Lower Decks. I am Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture. Now, just really, really quickly, for those of you who were with us last year, you know how Ups and Downs works. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time, Ups and Downs is pretty simple. We go through each episode and we give everything we like an up and everything we didn't like a down. With that in mind, here we go, Star Trek Lower Deck Season 2, Episode 1, Strange Energies, Ups and Downs. Oh, just an up for being back in general. I'm sorry, I realise how silly and arbitrary that might sound as an up, but you know what? This is my video. I can do whatever I want. It is so much fun to have Star Trek Lower Decks back. It is easily one of the best new treks we've got in a long time. We have an awful lot of care and attention being given to the franchise by creator Mike McMahon and the entire team involved. And to straight on to my second up, the entire opening scene of this episode. I mean, I mean, I could go through and up every single thing in this scene, but just for the sake of sanity and for Chris's patience, I'm going to give the entire opening just its own up. So this is only two, it could be about 50. But in this opening scene, we get callbacks to TNG Chain of Command, beautiful animations of the Cardassian Galar and Hideki class ships, Mariner in her physical Olivia Newton-John 80s best, so many so many ship easter eggs we've got a danube class runabout we of course have the miranda class uss mcduff a jemhadar battle cruiser bird of prey the romulan one from the original series we have look closely as well and we have a scimitar type warbird from star trek nemesis we've got quite a lot really and the bridge of the miranda class is literally a lift from the reliant it's all very exciting that entire opening scene gets an up and i'm going to be really cheeky and I gotta, gotta go for a third up. I know, I know I just said I wouldn't do this with the opening scene, but when Mariner very, very quickly interacts with Hologram Boimler, he goes, this is so upsetting, they keep showing me lights. Ah, as you may tell, I enjoyed this episode. We then go straight into the opening credits. Now they have been slightly updated and revamped with two main things. One is that the Cerritos itself has gone through a little bit of a, it's like a HD redesign, basically, from where it was in season one to where it is now. It's like a lot more detail has been added to the ship. And as well with the opening credits, we have that Borg Romulan battle that has been there since episode one of season one has changed slightly. We now have Klingon Birds of Prey taking part and some of those assembled pack led ships from the finale of season one. It's a lot of fun, it's a nice change, and that is gonna be already our fourth up of the episode and we haven't even got past the opening credits yet oh my now in this episode the cerritos is doing what it does best and it's completing a second contact mission what's different about season two episode one to season one episode one is that mariner and captain freeman have sort of embraced the fact that they are a mother and daughter team and they can do, you know, off the book stuff and even as much as it annoys C Commander Ransom, they seem to be getting on great, even though they're both winding each other up. It's quite funny to see how much both of them are really annoyed by this situation, even if they're outwardly not showing that. We get some classic Mariner style sort of lording it over everyone, which teeters on the edge of making her a little bit unlikable so it's kind of like there was a moment where i was like oh oh is that a down is that a down but the fact that she is so honest about the fact that she's really struggling with this situation isn't so much an up as it is a not down which is which is good which is positive Jerry O'Connell gets to shine as Commander Ransom in this episode, who takes on effectively the role of Gary Mitchell from the second pilot of the TOS, where no man has gone before. Now, there are so many callbacks and gags to this godlike creature. I'm giving it an up, and just Dr. Tiana smashes it in this episode. She is so funny with the different ideas that she starts to come up with, but jumping straight to the end for a second, the fact that in classic Kirk style, she fixes this godlike problem with a giant boulder. Up. 
it's so much fun and it's such a callback as well to the nonsense that we often saw in the original series. We have Ransom's giant godlike head trying to bite down on the Cerritos, which of course is a callback to Who Mourns for Adonis, where the giant green hand reaches out and grabs the Enterprise in space. What we are effectively seeing is Lower Deck's take on this. It's good crack and it's good fun and it's handled pretty well. I spoke to my esteemed colleague Paul Sutherland who is the king of Easter eggs when I was looking at this episode and he raised a good point which I do agree with. They do push the joke of Ransom a little bit far and I'm giving it a down. It just goes on a little bit too long. Just a little bit too long but I think in the grand scheme of things, we're on a good balance so far for this first episode of the season in terms of ups and downs. Now, back on the ship, we have Rutherford, who is still learning to, you know, adapt to having his memory erased in the finale of the last season. And of course, Tendi, who is just wonderful and also darkly psychotic in this episode, is trying to help him back to normal while also attempting to cock block him. He set himself up with a date with Barnes, who was the Trill member of the crew who he went on a date with back in the first episode of season one. In fact, this is such a rehash of his first story that Mariner even sort of goes, this seems familiar at one point. Tendi, in a horrifically inappropriate way, abuses her position as a member of the medical team to run all sorts of nonsensical tests on Rutherford because she sees him as having had a personality change and this is wrong and this is not her Rutherford, even though it's pretty clear she's just not happy with him dating Barnes. Now that may not be because she has feelings for him herself, this could go a different direction, but I mean, she shocks the crap out of the poor man. Usually one cortical stimulator is enough for a patient on Star Trek. She puts about 20 on him. It's a wonder the poor man doesn't explode. However, it's all as funny as anything. Up. By the end of their short but quite funny little exchange, you have Rutherford and Tendi again getting closer together as friends, even if he had to put a force field between them to make sure that it was safe. They come to a bit of an understanding, even as, you know, she apologizes and hugs him and whispers, don't date Barnes. In a frankly creepy, friendly, but creepy kind of way. It'll be interesting to see where they take this relationship in this season because, as I say, they can go down the romantic route or they can go down a different route. But either way, anyone who tries to date Rutherford in front of Tendi seems like they're going to be going down. The action on the Cerritos more or less wraps up with Ransom being transformed from godlike creature back into just godlike creature with a body I would love. We have Freeman and Mariner come to an understanding that as much as they want to get on with each other and work well together, they really do drive each other up the wall. It ends with Mariner in the brig for her actions, which did in fairness lead directly to Ransom's godification, Mitchellfication, Garyfication. They agree to go back to the way things were, but it's done with an understanding and a smile. I love the interactions between Tony Newsom and Don Lewis in this episode. It's fantastic. It's a great relationship on Star Trek Lower Decks. And for me, it's another up. Now, we're nearly there at the end of the episode already, but of course we would be remiss not to join in with the USS Titan to see how Boimler's getting on. And unsurprisingly, he is screaming for every second of his life. This poor young Lieutenant Junior Grade has never been so terrified, he's never been so scared, and he's never got to enjoy the pure madness of a Riker in command. As the Luna class vessel is attacked by several smaller little ships, Boimler is just not understanding the jazz throwaways that Riker is sending him. So he's just basically hitting buttons and doing what he can, and the next thing they're in a nebula and everyone's going through a motion picture style wormhole. It's just awesome, it's nonsense, it's another up from me. And this was such a fun start to the season. I really, really am excited to see where season two of Lower Decks goes 
this year. I will do anything I can to guest star on that show. Yes, I realize there's a slight issue there, but that's okay, it's fine. Now, one last thing before we go. Now, as we know, poor old Lieutenant Shax met his maker or met his prophets at the end of last season, but uh, Fred Tarasciore, his name is still in the credits. That's everything for this week, guys. I obviously didn't get a chance to cover every single Easter egg in this episode because we would be here until Christmas. However, keep joining back in with us every Friday while this season airs. We will go through the ups, the downs. If you reckon there was something that should have been massively upped, stick it in the comments below. If you reckon there was something that should have been massively downed, come on, it's the first episode. Give them all a break, guys. You can check us out over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Ferrick. You look after yourselves. I will chat to you soon, my friends. Live long and prosper.